Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, as you'll have seen from our press release, uh, we announced that we have our first recorded case of high pathogen avian influenza that's been found in a poultry farm in New Zealand. Uh, we, do, we do have low pathogen avian influenza circulating around New Zealand wildlife. Um, so this is different to the strain that's happening globally that we've been concerned about and been talking about, um, which is high pathogen H5N1. What we have here in New Zealand is high pathogen H7N6, so a different strain. Uh, the timeline of events was the farm in question. Uh, they were noticing issues last week. They reported to MPI on Friday afternoon some concerns. Uh, we had a person down, I was informed, 5 p.m. Friday evening. Uh, we had a person down there at, on Saturday. Tests were taken. Uh, those tests came back Saturday night. Uh, saying that this, this was the H7N6 strain, and, but we didn't know at that stage whether it was high pathogen or low pathogen. Uh, on Sunday, we again had more people head down. We put a restricted place notice on that farm to effectively lock it down. We started tracing of movements in and out of that farm, and we also uh, got the test results back at around 8 o'clock saying that it was in fact high pathogen avian influenza. Today more people have headed down to do further testing and contract, contact tracing and tomorrow depopulation of that farm will commence. Firstly I'd like, just like to say uh, really well done to the MPI staff involved for really getting onto this so quickly, particularly over a weekend and coming back so fast with the information and putting measures in place so that we can contain this. R rapid response is what is needed in these situations to prevent spread, and so we've done a good job here. Uh, just also, you know, I really feel for the farmer involved, being a farmer myself, it's a huge stress whenever you've got any sort of animal health issue on farm, and, you know, I'm, we're, I guess the whole industry should be grateful for this farmer for reporting and enabling us to get on top of this early. Uh, finally, I'd just like to add that, you know, for the public, I know we've been talking a lot about H5N1 and the threats that it poses. This is a different strain. There are a couple of key things here. Um, I would emphasise that there is no food safety risk as long as you cook the poultry and eggs properly as recommended, which you need to do for a whole range of other factors anyway. And there is you know, no evidence overseas. This, there have been many outbreaks of H7 uh, high pathogen avian influenza overseas and there never hasn't been a reported case of human contact of that. So the human health element or human safety, um, we're fairly confident that you know, there are very minimal risks here. Same with, you know, as we've been talking about with the H5N1 strain, a lot of concern around what that might mean for our wildlife. And this strain here, the, there has been, again, overseas, no evidence of it moving back from poultry into wildlife. So we do not have to worry about a spread back to wildlife and across the country. Our concern around spread will be people and gear moving from affected the affected property to other properties, which we're busy tracing at the moment. And finally, you know, we are, we've got this locked down at this stage in one shed on that farm, and we are going to, you know, really test and make sure we um, make sure that it hasn't spread anywhere else, and we've got measures in place to be trying to get on top of that spread if it was to spread to other sheds and prevent it from moving to other farms. So. I've got a whole range of experts here from health, uh, doc, biosecurity, food safety, and Ray. So happy to take any questions. You're an expert in lots of stuff, Ray. <laughs> what are the risks here? I mean, if this spreads, what, what are the main risks that you're concerned? So the main concern, if it was to spread, would be to our poultry industry. Uh, so that's the main area of concern. I don't know, Ray, if you wanted to add any more on that. No, uh, thanks, Minister. I think that's 
The, the main risk here is, the, is a poultry industry risk because of the type of um, virus that we've got. Um, so if you, yeah, this, this, this particular virus is prevalent in poultry farms around the world uh, because it's a mutation of, of a, a locally adapted virus. So it's not something that's been introduced into New Zealand. It's something that's adapted uh, or mutated from uh, a low pathogenic uh, virus in New Zealand. So the, the critical thing is we get in quickly and eradicate it from the particular site. So as the Minister said, we'll depopulate um, uh, the poultry there and, and the sheds that are affected and try to make sure that we trace any movements over the last couple of weeks that have gone uh, from that, that farm to make sure we don't have spread further out. So at the moment there's been um, two other sheds or farms that are viewed as um, you know, potential risks um, and another, uh, probably four others, wasn't it, Stu, um, low level medium. So you know, measures are in place and testing are, is happening around those other farms. Um, Stu, did you want to add more? Yeah, no, that's right. Um, so, yeah, we've identified six that have connections to that property. What we're doing at the moment is now working through the exact nature of those connections, uh, what's moved backwards or forwards, what risk that could uh, present, and then off the back of that, uh, any further action that needs to be taken. So it's, it's a work in progress uh, at the moment to understand that network of movements. How confident are you that it hasn't spread to those farms? So at the moment, uh, there are no signs in any, any other uh, poultry farms or operations of sickness or, or reduced production, which you'd expect to see with this uh, strain. Uh, so we're not seeing or having any reports of that from, from any other properties at the moment. And we're also not seeing any signs in the other sheds on that property. That's right at this stage. How many, how many chickens are affected on that initial farm? Uh, 40,000 are in that shed. What's yeah. the closest number? Uh, it's, it's about 20% it's about of the poultry farm. farm. That so farm, yeah. yeah. And they will be destroyed? Yes. The farm reported this to NDI on Friday, but how long did they have symptoms for before they make the report? Uh, so they initially started noticing um, issues back on Monday and they'd had their vet in uh, who was doing further testing as because diseases happen on farms on a regular basis and the first point of call is always your local vet um, to try and diagnose the problem and work through what the issues may be um, and certainly you know the symptoms were not that of high pathogen avian influenza to start with um, but then they contacted Mary on Friday wasn't it? Mary or you yeah, know look <coughs> they did the right thing um, uh, so it, they didn't they didn't have influenza symptoms which yep. which you might have expected yeah. um, and uh, they actually were applying antibiotics and trying that and then uh, as, as the days went on and they saw mortality increasing um, that's when they notified so no we think they they handled it yep. exactly right there's talk of the mutation of this into a high pathogen does that occur outside of the farm or is that occurring once this had been picked up in contact with these seafowl, am I correct? Waterfowl. Water uh, yeah, I think Mary's probably best to answer this but my understanding is that in all likelihood uh, you had other birds that had the low pathogen strain um, were in contact with birds in the shed and then the mutation happened within the shed but Mary's the much better expert on this than I am so Minister, I think that was a good answer. Um, the traditional way that highly pathogenic avian influenza emerges in commercial poultry is that there's a spillover event from a low path strain of the disease in wildlife, like ducks or waterfowl, that spills over in a contact between wildlife and poultry. And then that disease or that virus, as it gets passed between chickens in that poultry house, mutates. And that can then change into a highly pathogenic strain. So and it's the conditions of the farming that are likely to have contributed to this mutation? Yes, and also because of the way avian influenza viruses are, right? They get passed really easily between chickens, and they also are really labile, so they change bits out all the time. So as we know with influenza viruses, every year human influenza viruses change, right? And it's exactly the same with avian influenza viruses. Highly labile. How confident are you that we can eradicate this? 
very confident. Um, you saw in Australia they had H7 cases there and they have removed it from those locations. Um, so we're probably in a better space with the fact that this farm is actually way more isolated from neighbouring farms as opposed to that, the, the, the farms of where it happened in Australia. So we're in a much better place than Australia was in terms of stopping it and eradicating it. Um, this, as Mary and Ray had mentioned, this happens a lot overseas and basically they depopulate where it happens and that takes care of it. So really reasonably confident that we can um, go and get on top of it. Even if we eradicate, sorry, even yeah. if we eradicate it totally, do you expect all of the because it's such a massive problem? Uh, I don't could be. know if it, I mean, Mary again would be the expert, but you know, these it's always been in, you know, you roll the dice enough, you come up with certain numbers. So this could happen again, uh, but again, it would be the same thing of it's better for us to stamp it out in those locations and prevent spread elsewhere. So it could happen again. It's, I don't know, the risks factors. Mary, do you have any idea? Difficult to know. Yeah. If this containment or eradication does prove to be successful, what are your concerns uh, for the industry and for the country? Look, obviously there would be concerns for the industry. However, I do think we have a... I'm pretty confident that we will be on top of this. Um, so, you know, it's overseas experience has shown the processes to be able to stamp this out and eradicate it. We only a few months ago had a group from MPI and the poultry industry go over to Australia and visit um, the farms where they'd had that, the outbreak there and learn from what they did. So, you know, the team's been given a lot of prep in recent months to make sure we're, we're learning from overseas experiences and we're, you know, able to, I guess, start from a better place than what a number of these countries uh, did in their efforts because we've kind of learnt from what they've done. The, the other thing that's probably useful context yeah. on that is um, uh, within the last four years we've had two other poultry uh, related diseases that we've managed to uh, remove from the system. Uh, one was IBDV um, which is a, a bursal disease um, which was <coughs> introduced into New Zealand. Um, it got into uh, a few farms and we managed to uh, eradicate that and take that out of the network. And the second one you might recall was uh, when we had uh, Salmonella enteritis and um, we were worried about that and it was uh, particularly in the, in the eggs and so uh, again we managed to eradicate that. So we're going through a similar process. Yeah. We'll trace out, find the farms where it might be or they might get reported through symptoms, take quick action to circle around those and put zones around those and then slowly you delimit the number of farms that are affected um, until you can be confident that you have moved it from the system. So that normal biosecurity process that we always take when a disease arrives is exactly what we're going to do here. Um, and, you know, we might find another farm or two. Um, that's often the case, they pop up, because there's, a, there's an incubation period between, uh, between when these symptoms become um, noticeable. Um, hopefully, it's just this one farm and, and we, can, we can stop it there. Yeah. Is this infection likely to impact the wider supply chain at all? Not at this stage, uh, because as I said, it's only one shed on one farm. So, you know, if we're able to keep on top of it, no, it won't have any impact. Will there be any food recalls or any, anything like that? No, as I said at the start, um, poultry, eggs are safe. The avian influenza can be, is very susceptible to heat. So, you know, you just need to cook it in the normal, proper manner. Um, we're constantly telling people don't eat raw chicken and this reinforces that message uh, for another reason why not to eat raw chicken. Yeah. That 80% of the poultry that you see wasn't uh, affected. How, how can you assure that's not at risk? Uh, well, it's potentially at risk. That's why there is a restricted place notice on that farm. That's why we're doing, so we've already done uh, yesterday, there were two uh, the two most at risk sheds that were closest to it had testing done. More testing has been done today. Uh, we'll be getting results back uh, from that testing yesterday, later tonight, and obviously tomorrow getting test uh, results back from those other sheds. And so we'll keep on testing, and just that restricted place notice will stay in place until we're certain that we have eradicated it from that premise. Just to clarify, how many chickens are going to be killed before that 40,000? 40, 40,000 in that shed. And they will be 
Yes. What are the costs for the building? So when we um, put a restricted place notice on, that means we're effectively using powers under the Biosecurity Act, um, in which case they are compensatable. So for any cost that the business has suffered as a result of us applying the Biosecurity Act, they will be compensated for. Moira Pass. Yeah. Mo Moiraki. Very useful. Uh, unplanned, unwanted, <laughs> but very useful, and I think we'll make the most uh, very good use of this experience to really sharpen our systems and make sure, you know, I commend the team so far for the actions that have been undertaken, uh, but obviously there will be some things we can learn from it, and that will help us, you know, if we ever do have H5N1 arrive or if this was to be repeated again with an H7 variant. Uh, it probably actually increases the risk because free range are more open to wildlife coming and visiting them. So I was at a free range farm two weeks ago. Um, we're announcing sort of the preparedness campaign for H5N1 and one of the actions that free range farms will need to take and that farmer was showing me his systems that when, you know, if H5N1 were to come, they will need to basically secure their chickens inside the, the buildings to stop any sort of outside wildlife birds getting in. Um, if you're a fan of Clarkson's Farm, or if you haven't watched Clarkson's Farm, recommend season one. Uh, Jeremy goes through what he had to do to protect his birds over in the UK. Yeah. Would that be a fair response that there could be egg shortages? Look, at this stage you would say no, there won't be egg shortages because, it, as I mentioned, it's limited to one shed on one farm. Now, if that were to change, maybe, but I'll just stress to people, don't need to go out and stockpile eggs, and for the love of God, don't go and stockpile toilet paper. You know, we don't need that again. How's the farmer feeling? Uh, obviously, you know, I haven't told, I'm going down to meet him tomorrow, um, but, you know, obviously, you know, beaten up as you would. Um, no one wants to have this happen on their property. Um, I think Stu and Mary, you may have talked to him and be able to... Yes, yeah, we, yeah. <coughs> um, we, well, um, uh, John Mackay is the chief executive of the, of Mainland, and, uh, you know, fortunately, he travelled with our staff to the UK um, only a couple of months ago when we were looking at how they handled bird flu outbreaks. So he's well versed. Um, we've been working together as a team with the industry actually for several months now. So that's been a positive in a sense that um, we've been getting ourselves well prepared for the big one if it arrived. Uh, so now that we've got this strain here, uh, we're dealing with someone that's seen on the ground uh, yeah. how others have responded. So look, but it's, it will be challenging for him with all of his staff. Um, today as they prepare and you know there's a big exercise in depopulating and, and then cleaning uh, those sheds and then of course repopulating again once they're clear. Do you know how long that might take? Uh, two or three days. So two or three days to yeah. depopulate yeah. and then then there'll be a cleaning period so that'll, you know that'll, that'll probably, you're probably looking at a sort of four to six week period between de depopulating, cleaning, testing as best you can in the environment that, yeah. that the virus is not present and then repopulating again. Yeah. I know this is a bit grim, but how do you kill that many chickens? Uh, they, they, um, because you'll be aware, <laughs> we may not be aware, but you know, poultry farms are always having to um, depopulate uh, and repopulate, and so um, they have um, large containers, and they go into the containers, and uh, it's effectively a carbon dioxide um, yeah, process. Can you say, you have a bit of but what is the next stage of Well, as we mentioned earlier, the incubation period can be between 14 and 21 days. So, you know, we are going to be testing for that period of time. And um, that's, you know, if we go out 21 days from now um, and there's been no other positive tests, so I think we can 
feel fairly reassured that we've gotten on top of this. And across the other farms, do you have proposals that are still policy numbers that could be at risk? Uh, I can't, sorry, um, top of my head I don't have the... Um, no. I, th I think, you know, the main... But, but just to give you a bit of context, I mean, mainland farms, uh, it's sizeable, but it's not, I don't think it's the biggest operation um, by any stretch. So you talk, that's got about 200,000 birds, I think. Um, but there are, there are bigger ones as well, and there's a lot spread throughout New Zealand, and including yeah. in the North Island. So um, there'd, there'd be a long way to go before we became concerned about, you know, supply issues or repopulation issues. Yeah. What evidence have you learned from the virus? I think the, the biggest lesson from Bovis was we had something that was circulating from... So I wasn't at MPI, obviously, I was just a farmer back then, but I would say the biggest problem was there. Um, something was in circulating for nearly probably two years before we identified it. Here, you know, we're, of, um, we're on top of this pretty early, and so, I mean, that was the biggest challenge with Bovis, was all that tracing, trying to work out where all these animals have gone. That's why it's taken so long. Very different position here. Um, I wouldn't liken this to Bovis at all. I think it's very, very different. One bonus question then. Um, <laughs> you know how there was concern from uh, Doc about the implications of the virus on the native birds? Have you had much of a discussion with them about this? They're right here. Um, <laughs> So, so yeah, look. Um, obviously, we've been, you know, as been working with health and Doc in terms of if H five N one was to arrive, Doc have been doing work around uh, managing or, or you know how can they protect wildlife with the vaccination program. Um, but I will. Yeah, are we able to hear about the current risk? Yeah, so um, to repeat what the Minister said before, we think in this situation it's a really low risk because yeah. there isn't evidence that this is likely to get back into the wild. Oh. So we're continuing to work with MPI on preparing for um, H5N1 and uh, we've been doing some vaccination trials, but they're quite limited in their use because you have to have known birds that you can recapture multiple times to give them different doses. And that's been more a trial to understand whether our native birds develop um, antibodies. We've got plans of all the locations we need to look at and how we would um, look after different species, but it is a challenge because there's not a, actually a lot that you can do. Thank you. Nothing else? Thank you.